Hi everyone and welcome to uh, Melbourne IVF's uh, live. Um, first of all, we're going to be discussing uh, topics that are probably are going to evoke some emotional responses for a lot of you. And uh, you know, my heart goes out to any of you that unfortunately have suffered a pregnancy loss, whether that be a miscarriage or a pregnancy loss that's later on in pregnancy. They, they are, of course, the most distressing things. And I always liken a pregnancy loss um, as the loss loss of an, an opportunity of life and a loss of a dream of having a child. And it is, of course, the most distressing part in any couple, any woman's life. Um, and it's something that we as fertility specialists, obstetricians and gynaecologists take exceptionally seriously. And, you know, as I said before, my heart goes out to all of you. Um, and I'm, and um, But can I assure you of one thing, and that is that certainly we as, we as fertility specialists, and particularly those involved with Melbourne IVF, will obviously do the utmost to ensure that for all of you, there will be a brighter day ahead. I think today what I'd really like to talk a little bit about is things in relation to uh, pregnancy loss, but also there's some general questions that people also have with respect to fertility, which I think we'll cover as well, and sort of a little bit of a a bit of a rounding up of uh, of issues with related to fertility and obviously pregnancy. One of the things that I get com great comfort with is actually um, seeing couples who have unfortunately suffered a pregnancy loss, um, whether that be early on in their pregnancy or of course later on in pregnancy, and being able to assist them not only through their fertility journey, uh, conception, and also taking that first baby photo on an ultrasound scan, but more importantly for me as an obstetrician as well, being able to care for a woman all the way through pregnancy and childbirth. And it's especially special for someone who's um, suffered you know, pregnancy loss or stillbirth or, or, um, or a miscarriage early, early on. And uh, you know, the, what I can assure all of you is that you know, whilst if you've gone through a difficult time, there are remedies, there are things that we can do as, as, as doctors in order to help. So I thought, first of all, we might talk a little bit about what are the reasons that miscarriages do occur. And most of you have been very familiar with the recent documentary on miscarriages and highlighting the fact more specifically that one in four women, unfortunately, will have a diagnosis of a miscarriage. Now the reality of the situation is on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, all our social media and in fact mainstream media will gladly and happily report pregnancy news. So you know, someone who's 13 weeks, 20 weeks and we always see these lovely photos of babies within an ultrasound scan and of course gender reveals which have become exceptionally popular over the course of the last couple of years. But what we're not familiar with of course because the topic has until recently been taboo is the fact that miscarriage occurs to so many women and to so many couples, and yet it's not in mainstream media and it's not talked about. And as a result, as an individual who suffers or has had a miscarriage or a pregnancy loss, you feel isolated and alone. And as an obstetrician, as well as being a fertility specialist, I'm, I'm often asked by couples and women um, in respect to you know why, when we should tell people when we actually are pregnant. And of course, the reason why most people wait until 13 weeks is because they're waiting for the Down syndrome screening test to come back. But also there's a sense that if you tell people too early and something doesn't ha quite go right, there's a sense of failure. One thing I can assure you is your body doesn't fail you just because you've had a miscarriage. And then in actual fact, I encourage all my patients to tell people soon when they're pregnant because it's really important to surround yourself with people who will be there to protect you and guide you and counsel you and provide a shoulder to cry on if indeed you've had a miscarriage. So I think the first things first, we should talk a little bit about the causes or the reasons for miscarriage. And they can be divided up into um, several different categories and we'll go through them individually and then I'll talk a little bit about what we can do in order to remedy those things. So the first thing is something called a chromosomal abnormality. Now, many of you are familiar with the fact that we have genes, but those genes are pat and the DNA is packaged together in something called a chromosome. And as human beings, we all have a pair of 22 chromosomes. And of course, we've also got uh, the X and the Y chromosome if we're male and X and X if we're female. 
One of the things I want you to imagine is that as humans, uh, the male obviously will give a portion of the chromosomes across to the embryo, the developing pregnancy, and of course the female will also give a proportion of uh, the chromosomes across to the pregnancy as well. I want you to imagine on one side we have all the male chromosomes linked together like volumes of an encyclopedia. So in other words, there's two volume ones, two volume twos, two volume threes, all the way in through until we get volume 22. And there's also an X and a Y volume. On the flip side, on the maternal side, there are also two volume ones, two volume twos, all the way through until we hit 22 with an X and an X. Now when an embryo is created, it's like taking one volume of mums, um, uh, volume one from the bookshelf and putting it into the new developing pregnancy and taking one of dad's volume one and putting it in to the uh, into the pregnancy as well and you can imagine these books flying out from the bookshelf to repopulate a new set of 22 volumes with a pair of each of them and of course the male will send across either an x and a y and the female will always send an x and an x and depending on whether the male sends an x or a y will ultimately depend on whether the pregnancy is a male or a female now unfortunately as a woman ages uh, many of the chromosomes that are in the bookshelf can potentially become stuck. Either they can become stuck together and so they both populate the new developing pregnancy. So there'll be three copies of a particular chromosome in the example, of, for example, of Down syndrome where there are two copies of tr chromosome 21 or two volume 21s that come into the pregnancy and one from the paternal side, meaning that there are three copies of chromosome 21. Or alternatively, the volumes within the bookshelf actually get stuck so none come out. So whilst there may be a chromosome 21 that comes out from the paternal side, no, no volume 21s come from the maternal side. And so the developing embryo or the pregnancy has a deficiency in the number of chromosomes. It's missing a chromosome. Now they ha happen as a woman ages quite randomly. And Unfortunately, around, and it can also happen in women who are younger. And of course, uh, any rearrangement or any addition or subtraction of chromosomes, as, as it would be a subtraction of, or addition of volumes of the encyclopedia, could ultimately result in a miscarriage. And we know that approximately 50% of pregnancies, up to 70% of pregnancies, will often be a result of a chromosomal rearrangement. And as much as this is distressing, because of course in some cases you certainly see a pregnancy with a heartbeat, it is nature's way of saying that unfortunately this is not a pregnancy that should go ahead. And one of the things I think that's comforting for a lot of people is to know that historically we as doctors used to say to women, look, we, there's a couple of things we used to say. Number one, we're not going to test to see if there's any reasons for miscarriage. And number two, Historically, doctors used to say, look, we're not going to wait. We're going to wait until three months until we, we uh, ask you to become pregnant again. One thing I can say now is that any, as I said earlier, any pregnancy loss is, a, is the loss of a potential dream, a potential uh, life and, and also a potential parent being parents. And so that can be quite devastating for a couple. And one pregnancy loss is too much. And in actual fact now most, if not all of us, will actually investigate early on in terms of miscarriage. Indeed, couples who come and see me for fertility treatment, I will automatically work them up for pre-pregnancy in their pre-pregnancy counselling for concerns with respect to pregnancy loss because I don't want anyone to experience a pregnancy loss per se. The other thing is this historic rule of waiting for three months until you can conceive again has really been tossed out and indeed most, most fertility specialists, obstetricians and gynaecologists now will recommend couples commence trying again with the next period, assuming of course that physically and emotionally you're, 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 in, you're in good shape. One of the things you do of course is recover quite quickly uh, physically, but you know, emotionally the toll can be quite hard. And certainly for any of you who are experiencing any potential uh, distress with respect to miscarriage, please speak to your doctor reach out to your general practitioner and seek the support and guidance of a psychologist because you know, you're not alone in this and also reach out to friends and family. But we do know that if you actually try to become pregnant sooner rather than later, that the chance of a pregnancy, particularly in those first three months, is 70% greater than if you just waited. So they did a study where they looked at women and they said to women, okay, don't get pregnant for three to six months, 
And these other women were told, please get pregnant straight away. And what they found in actual fact was the women who were told to get pregnant straight away, up to 70% of them were actually pregnant whilst the other women were waiting behind. So as long as you're feeling physically, medically, and all the tests and investigations prove that there isn't an issue with uh, pregnant and with a potential recurrent uh, pregnancy loss, then please don't hesitate to try again. But you know, seek the advice of your doctor. So one of the biggest issues, as I've highlighted, is related to a chromosomal issue, and it is nature's way, unfortunately, of saying that this wasn't the right time. The other thing is related to a structural abnormality within the uterus. The uterus, of course, is a womb. It's where the, the, the embryo will implant. But think of it rather as a room. Now, if you're putting, a, for example, a nice plant within a room, you want to make sure that it can grow big and wide in that room and expand as much as it possibly can. If there are any partitions within the room or if there's something bulging into the room, then, of course, that will limit the capacity for that tree to blossom within that particular room. So sometimes we have concerns with partitions within the womb, which are called septums, or alternatively fibroids, which encroach into the cavity of the womb. And these can impact um, the, the, a pregnancy and unfortunately lead to pregnancy loss. And so as fertility specialists, we will obviously look inside the womb. We may do some ultrasound scans or some tubal patency tests, having a look and trying to define whether the womb is structurally normal and is receptive to pregnancy. The next issue relates specifically to autoimmune conditions and there's a wide range of autoimmune conditions, the major one being lupus and we look for anti-cardiolipe and antibodies and lupus anticoagulant which have been reported to cause miscarriage and of course there are things we can do, things like clexane and aspirin in order to reduce the risk of miscarriage in any future pregnancy. The next thing we look at particularly is hormonal issues. And so things like thyroid disease and diabetes and even PCOS can potentially lead to miscarriage. And this is one thing that we obviously look at pre-pregnancy in order to make sure there is, we're mitigating against the risk of that by controlling any issues with respect to high sugar levels or alternatively maintaining good and adequate support of the thyroid hormone in order to reduce the risk of miscarriage. Uh, most recently, uh, clotting disorders have been dispelled as a reason for causing miscarriage. And so many doctors will still um, uh, investigate for things like protein C and protein S deficiency. Um, but really the reality of the situation is they are very rarely cause any concerns with pregnancy. And then there are things that are subsequently in development, things where we know that there's a potential risk of miscarriage, but yet the evidence uh, number one, not only in terms of, of it actually specifically causing it, but more importantly, how to treat it is sort of in, in the verge of, of coming out. So it's emerging technologies. And these are things like natural killer cells. Um, and in addition to that, uh, also sperm DNA fragmentation. It's a difficult concept to explain sperm DNA fragmentation, but the sperm, of course, the integrity of the sperm needs to be good in order to fertilize an egg but we do know that if men have a degradation of their sperm that that can lead unfortunately to embryos developing poorly within an IVF cycle or alternatively miscarriage and the way that I like to describe sperm DNA fragmentation to my patients is imagine you've got a bakery and that's the testes and the bread being produced in the bakery is sperm within the testes the sperm are produced just like oven, uh, just like bread is produced within a bakery. But of course, as the bread then travels from that bakery and goes out to Woolies or Coles, it can become stale. And so when you get it from Woolies or Coles, you might find that it, it it's not doesn't taste as good. Well, the same thing can happen with sperm. As sperm is stored within the testes and waits to, to come out through the ejaculate, that sperm DNA can subsequently fragment and that can lead to a poor quality development of the embryo and of course miscarriage. So these are tests that your doctor may, may actually um, decide to, to undertake in order to give you the best chance of being able to conceive in the future. The other things of course in relation to pregnancy loss can occur beyond 13 weeks and this is the stroke structural integrity of the cervix itself. So where we have cervical insufficiency, where the cervix shortens during pregnancy and unfortunately women lose their, 
their their babies you know from the 16th 20th 20 before their 24th week where the likelihood of having a baby and being able to take that baby home is very remote and then there's issues such as infection which can also cause a concern and sending infection into the uterus and so these are other reasons as to why pregnancy early later pregnancy losses can occur and part of any work up then in terms of uh, miscarriage is obviously to mitigate or reduce the risk of that occurring again by fully investigating and making sure that there isn't anything that we can identify and that we can subsequently reverse in order to prevent a miscarriage for the future. And that's part of what we do as fertility specialists, as what we do as gynaecologists and also obstetricians in order to make sure that those brighter days are going to come ahead. One of the things that many couples will speak about is why does a miscarriage occur even with IVF and of course you know whilst IVF can certainly create an embryo and we can implant that embryo within the uterus there are a multitude of other factors uh, related to the immune system related to the microbiome which can all have an impact on the development of that embryo and this is why it's particularly important to have things investigated potentially before you actually do IVF so that um, when we're mitigating or preventing the risk of miscarriage in those, in those first few IVF cycles. But there is a role for IVF, particularly for women who have recurrent miscarriages, where we think the likelihood of miscarriage is particularly occurring because of a chromosomal issue with respect to the embryo. So one of the great things in the modern technology that we're able to do is sample the embryo by taking between four to six cells from the outer shell of the embryo and sampling those cells and expanding the DNA. So breaking open the cells, extracting the DNA, and then through a chemical reaction, expanding that DNA so that we can make sure that the embryos that we're putting back into a woman are chromosomally normal, something called euploid embryos. And the great thing about this is that we know that those embryos will have around about a 50 to 60% chance of pregnancy. And assuming all the other factors, autoimmune conditions, endocrine, endocrinological conditions, the structural integrity of the uterus, the sperm DNA, immunological factors are all controlled for, then the chance of pregnancy and an ongoing pregnancy is exceptionally high. Um, Kelly's asked specifically related about lifestyle changes. There is evidence, of course, that stress does play a role in, uh, in miscarriage. And so, you know, making sure that you surround yourself again by a good support network is going to be particularly important. I think one of the advantages of going through Melbourne IVF is that you have a personal doctor that goes through the whole process in terms of your fertility journey, whether that be from your first appointment uh, to then the follow-up appointment, subsequently through any scans that you might have through your fertility journey, not necessarily through IVF, but if indeed you do do IVF, of course, the fertility scans during IVF, also the embryo, you know, the egg collection rather, and the embryo transfer, and of course that first pregnancy scan. So that continuity of care is is what will you truly, you know, you truly desire in terms of this particular fertility journey. But it's also what patients, um, you know, desire in terms of you know, making sure they've got great access to their doctor. And of course, having a good outcome is, is founded by that rapport and relationship that you have with your medical specialist. But then it's important also to acknowledge that there's things like, you know, counsellors, nursing team, your friends and family that can also be there to support. I think there's also issues with respect to making sure you have a healthy diet, uh, looking at any supplements that can improve ovarian and also sperm function because that's obviously going to be vitally important in making sure that that embryo develops well within the uterus. Um, but IVF does have a role, and as I've rightly said before, that, is that role is in, in, in the setting of women who've had recurrent miscarriages and being able to screen that embryo to make sure that embryo is genetically normal. Um, I've, I think I've answered um, a few questions specifically related to uh, miscarriages. Um, and then I've also, uh, is there any considerations for women with antiphospholipid syndrome seeking fertility treatment? And as I alluded to before, uh, lupus anticoagulants and antiphospholipid antibodies are linked with uh, miscarriage. And certainly the evidence would suggest that low dose aspirin and or clexane can mitigate against that risk of a future pregnancy loss. And particularly also uh, concerns with respect to the pregnancy itself. 
Uh, women are, uh, again, asking about miscarriage and full cycle. Uh, should we wait a full cycle again before trying? Um, two and a half, uh, this particular patient is two and a half weeks post the miscarriage and hates waiting for the, uh, the idea of waiting any longer. And as I alluded, alluded to before at the start of my um, uh, at the start of my presentation, there's no doubt that you do not need to wait. So assuming that the pregnancy hormone has returned to low, to zero, and that you feel physically and more importantly, emotionally well, then there's no harm in trying once again. One of the things that I do with all my patients, and I suppose I'm fortunate that not only do I look after women during their fertility journey, but also have the, the continuity of being able to look after women during their pregnancy as well, is I'll offer women a frequent ultrasound scan every week up until we hit 13 weeks. And whilst the evidence is, there's one study, but the evidence suggests that in actual fact that reduces the risk of miscarriage. And it probably is because there's less stress, there's less cortisol floating around the system when you know that every week you've got this ultrasound scan that's continuing to provide you reassurance that the pregnancy is going okay. So that'll mean a scan at six weeks, it'll mean a scan at seven weeks, it'll mean a scan at eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks, 11 and 12 weeks, just to make sure that you're reassured that everything's going beautifully with this pregnancy. Um, and that's particularly important, I think, if you're suffering from you know, the trauma of a previous miscarriage and the concern, particularly when you get to the same point where the pregnancy happened before, pregnancy loss happened before. I had a woman only today who did IVF and she had a little bit of cramping at six weeks and she recalled that, you know, three months ago she had a miscarriage right at six weeks. So she rang, rang me up. It wasn't even her first uh, antenatal appointment, but, but rang me up and I squeezed her in today for just a you know, 15 minute consult just to make sure that she could see her baby and the baby's heartbeat on the ultrasound scan. And that gave her an immense sense of relief that whilst last time at six weeks she experienced the same symptoms and then miscarried, today she was experiencing the same symptoms, but it was just the uterus starting to stretch and all the blood flow coming into the uterus, but she could see the heartbeat and was really reassured that the baby was going okay. And of course, I've offered her the same thing, that if any time over the course of the next week, she feels stressed, she feels upset, she can come and see me for an ultrasound scan. Why does your body take a while to register that there's a mis miscarriage? I mean, this is one of the cruel tricks of nature and it would be, you know, it would be so nice for us to not have to diagnose a pregnancy loss for a woman who's had a, a pregnancy loss at um, seven weeks and, and then to see it at 10 weeks, some three weeks later. But there continues to be pregnancy tissue despite the fact that the embryo and the, fe the fetus may not have a heartbeat. There continues to be pregnancy tissue that continues to support the ovary to produce progesterone. And that progesterone and oestrogen will limit your... Um, uh, your, your period from coming. So as a result, the body continues to, f to think it's pregnant, continues to pour out all this pregnancy hormone. You continue to have pregnancy symptoms, but unfortunately, um, the pregnancy hasn't continued. And uh, it's one of the most cruel tricks of nature, and it's the hardest thing I think you know I have in my job as as a as a specialist is um, you know not seeing a heartbeat. One of the greatest joys is seeing a heartbeat. And I'm sure it's as it is for couples. And the most heartbreaking thing is not seeing a heartbeat. And of course, that's you know, immeasurable, uh, infinitesimal compared to the uh, uh, immeasurable loss that a couple feels or a woman feels when um, when they don't see a heartbeat as well. Um, so someone's actually specifically written that um, there's you know not been told not to wait. Uh, Kelly's written, I've had a failed IVF followed by a miscarriage and then followed another failed transfer. Should I request further in investigation before I try? There's absolutely no doubt. You, you need to investigate even after one miscarriage. As I said before, I tend to investigate even before the first miscarriage, but there's no doubt in my mind that you should be investigated You know, before you do any transfer. That, that first miscarriage is just enough to then warrant a full investigation before you do another. And some doctors will be, um, you know, they'll limit their scope in terms of in terms of their 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 remit in terms of the the type of testing they will do for miscarriages. And other doctors may expand that. So, you know, it, it's important to see someone that you know understands 
the loss that you're suffering and then also understand the importance of making sure uh, that um, you know, no stone is left unturned when it comes to trying to find a reason why you've had a miscarriage. Um, subclinical hypothyroidism is something that Madison has written. And, uh, my prior, one of my roles has been in the past sitting on the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists uh, Women's Health Committee and I was deputy chair of that committee. Uh, and that committee basically looked at all the guidelines with respect to women's health and directed policy in terms of treatment uh, for specific medical conditions. And Madison, I ask you, and if anyone else wants to, to check RANSCOG, R-A-N-Z-C-O-G, uh, statement on subclinical hypothyroidism. Uh, th there's two hats that I wear, I suppose. I wear a fertility hat and I also wear an obstetrician's hat. As a fertility specialist, I do like to see the TSH be less than 2.5 uh, when we're trying to conceive. However, the studies as an obstetrician suggest that subclinical hypothyroidism, even in the setting of TPO or thyroid peroxidase antibodies, there's no influence on the outcome of pregnancy. And in actual fact, the TSH level, the thyroid stimulating hormone level can be really high, can be up to 10, as long as the active form of thyroid hormone is within normal range. And so the RANSCOG has then subsequently modified their guidelines with the treatment of subclinical hypothyroid in the context of these larger studies that have suggested that there's no increased risk of miscarriage associated with subclinical hypothyroidism. That said, hypothyroidism itself is definitely something we would want to treat, particularly in relation to miscarriage. Danielle's written, what is the chance of IVF succeeding to full term after multiple miscarriages if a woman has had successfully carried a first baby to term. So any miscarriage, as I said before, doesn't necessarily mean that any subsequent pregnancy will result in a miscarriage. Um, the rate of miscarriage, obviously, you know, it's exceptionally, exceptionally, exceptionally rare to have three in a row. And that's why historically the medical profession didn't investigate until three, because we knew that one miscarriage was common, two was relatively common, and three rarely ever occurred. And as I said before, I think our mentality or our thinking on testing for miscarriages now has meant that we realise the importance in terms of women and, and also men and partners uh, in terms of uh, any pregnancy loss and the, and the great impact that has upon us as a community. And that's why we test a lot earlier. But that said, uh, you know, the chance of a full-term full -term pregnancy will be exceptionally high and I would anticipate that if you've had, even if you've had a more, one miscarriage, assuming that all the other factors that have been uh, controlled for, and the fact that you've had a full-term pregnancy, uh, or pregnancy rather than a full-term, the chance is quite high that you will have one. Someone's had a frozen embryo transfer, would you recommend progesterone before or after transfer when history of miscarriage? So there is, again, Ranskog has got statements with respect to uh, the use of progestogen uh, in, in reducing recurrent miscarriage. There's no evidence that it will reduce recurrent miscarriages, but there is evidence, of course, that it reduces, potentially reduces the risk of a threatened miscarriage. Certainly in any setting of a embryo transfer where we thawed out an embryo, we would always recommend progesterone. In my own practice, I give women, regardless of whether they're having a thawed embryo cycle or a fresh embryo cycle, progestogen up until 12 weeks. And I try to maintain the level of progestogen sitting anywhere above 40 to 50. And this means that there's an adequate level of progestogen to support the pregnancy uh, beyond obviously six weeks and of course through to 12 weeks. Dose bloody relationship have effect. Does something relationship, or maybe Jamela might re Jig her question to me. Um, looking forward to meeting you in December. Well, I certainly look forward to meeting you as well, Christina, in September. Um, and hopefully we will both achieve a better outcome in terms of pregnancy loss. And one of the things I like to say about Melbourne IVF, and this is not, I mean, obviously, I don't get paid by Melbourne IVF, and I'm certainly, uh, whilst I work with them, I'm not, uh, I'm not forced to say anything nice about in, in Melbourne IVF. But one thing I can say is that as an individual practitioner who has the, the ability to be able to choose any provider that I want to work with, I could leave Melbourne IVF and choose to work for someone else, that the organisation itself strives 
every day in order to achieve uh, success in terms of pregnancy outcome. And that not only comes from your doctors, but it also comes from the nurses, the counsellors, the administrative support, the management team, our embryologists, our science, scientific directors, uh, our people working within the lab, uh, our people working within our genetics lab, all of the people surrounding there. And I, and I have this little mantra, which is, you know, there is one one doctor, you see one doctor at Melbourne IVF, there's one team, a team of individuals, but we all work together uh, with one with one ultimate goal. And we work under one umbrella and that's one clinic, Melbourne IVF. And I think the thing that you can be reassured with is that you know we also uh, have a very great collegiate community. And if you're ever feeling disenfranchised with one particular doctor, feel free to say to that doctor, hey, listen, do you mind having the case reviewed? I, I often will review my cases with other colleagues within our organisation to make sure that we're getting things. There might be something that, you know, you, you, you want to have a fresh pair of eyes look over. There's no need necessarily to seek a second opinion. And often, in fact, when patients come to me for a second opinion, unless you're feeling disenfranchised with the doctor, you don't feel like your doctor's giving you the answers that you need, I always write back to the doctor. If you come and see me, I always write back to the doctor and say, hey, listen, so-and-so's come and seen me. This is something that, you know, I've, I've suggested this, this or that. And then you go back to that doctor. I, to be honest, the greatest joy that I have, irrespective of whether you do IVF or fertility treatment or clomid ovulation induction or letrozole ovulation induction or cycle tracking with me, is actually being able to care for women during pregnancy as well. So whether you become pregnant you know, under my care or whether you become pregnant under someone else's care, if you've come and seen me and you're happy with me being your doctor, I'm more than happy to look after you when you're pregnant. You don't necessarily need to come and see me for fertility. Um, how long would you recommend progestogen for? I've sort of alluded to that in terms of taking it up to 12 weeks. How long after a miscarriage should you expect a period? I think one of the, this is one of the biggest dilemmas. I mean, a lot of women will think, you know, geez, how long can I start trying? I really want to start trying again. That pregnancy hormone level will slowly come down to zero. And once it does, the brain then acknowledges that there's no pregnancy hormone anymore and will then start the process of initiating ovulation. So the time interval from when the pregnancy hormone starts up high until it comes down low will be different according to the length of, of the, the time that you've had. You, you, your your pregnancy for so someone who's six weeks eight weeks 12 weeks will have a higher pregnancy hormone and of course um how how you've lost your pregnancy so whether that's been you know naturally um, or alternatively you've had a dnc within the hospital where we've removed all the products um, i always offer my patients you know options in terms of how to manage their pregnancy loss uh, early pregnancy loss or miscarriage, and they can be conservative. So in other words, allowing your body to naturally um, pass the products. In some cases, it can also be the utilization of medicine in order to help facilitate um, that pregnancy loss through a nat natural means, or alternatively, surgical management, which includes a suction D and C. It's worth noting, and it's probably, you know, really important to know that if you are planning to have a natural miscarriage or allow your body to pass the products naturally that in actual fact it can be quite painful and it, and also there can be a, a significant amount of blood and really at that point in time you'd want to be surrounding yourself with a loved one who can care for you or care for other children or care for someone else if you need to look after someone else so that you're able to to, to, to have someone to lean upon and certainly i always give women adequate pain relief if they're going through that process as well. I mean, it, it is traumatic, uh, you know, whichever way you decide. Um, but um, as I said before, hopefully if any of you have experienced those pregnancy losses, um, that in the future you, you get all the advice um, and support that you need. Now, I did want to go through some questions that people posted on Instagram. If your partner's not ready for fertility treatment, then then what? I think. This is moving into the realms now of general fertility. So if anyone does have any questions about miscarriage, please don't post, uh, please post them. But I think, um, you know, the reality of the situation is that with fertility treatment, it does require both partners, uh, you know, whether you're in a same-sex relationship or heterosexual relationship, to commit to the process of fertility treatment and subsequently commit to the process of 
becoming a parent. Um, it's difficult if you're not in a situation where both of you, you're, you're, you're aligned in terms of the common goal. And I think one of the things then is really to seek guidance and counsel, not only from your doctor, but also from a counsellor to make sure that, you know, what you want out of life is uh, what your partner wants out of life. And that's true not only in terms of fertility treatments, in terms of, uh, you know, parenthood as well, but in, in a range of things. So I think it's really difficult and, and, and I, um, you know, my... my, my yeah, you know, my heart goes out to you, and I hope that um, you're able to 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 work through that with your partner. And does fertility improve after a laparoscopic removal of endometriosis? And I've done multiple. For those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, I try to do an Instagram live every Sunday where I talk about issues related to women's health, whether it be gynaecological fertility or alternatively pregnancy. And I've talked about endometriosis and the fact that endometriosis does decrease the chance of pregnancy. The way that it does that is it can impair the egg being released from the ovary, it can impair the egg and the embryo moving down the fallopian tube, it can prevent the sperm meeting the egg for fertilization to occur, and it can subsequently impair the implantation of that embryo within the womb. And it does that because it is inflammatory. It's sending in inflammatory cells into the uterus, into the pelvis, which prevent all those processes from occurring. And in actual fact, by removing endometriosis, the chance of pregnancy increases around about 50%. So to give you an example, if I see a couple and we've tried to optimize natural conception for three or four months, even if the woman doesn't have symptoms of endometriosis, which generally include pelvic pain, discomfort, pain with sexual intercourse, pain with a period, uh, heavy menstrual loss, sometimes it can, it can affect other organs even above and away from the pelvis. Um, in the absence of those symptoms, around 30 to 40% of women will still have endometriosis and they may have just very mild, small deposits of endometriosis. So removing that endometriosis, and the only way of doing that, of course, is via laparoscopic procedure, can improve dramatically the chance of pregnancy. So I perform you know, laparoscopies every week, probably two or three or four a week, um, and where we remove the endometriosis, and it's not surprising then that those women come back pregnant two or three months later, because two things, we've number one, removed the endometriosis, and number two, we've also flushed the tubes, which gives us a great chance of pregnancy. How much harder is it for someone with endo and adenomyosis to become pregnant? I've already sort of alluded to endo. Does breastfeeding affect fertility once period returns? Now, uh, breastfeeding is designed, I suppose, in a way of being a form of contraception because if you were thinking about us being animals sitting out in the in the savanna or something like that, you know, we wouldn't want to have another child if we've already got a child on the breast because we're caring for one child. We can't at least afford to have an, another child that potentially we need to care for. And so breast milk or the breast production, the process of releasing prolactin, which is predominantly the breast milk hormone, actually suppresses ovulation so that you don't become pregnant. Um, you can, however, do fertility treatment. So there are ways of us being able to circumnavigate uh, the whole process of suppression of the hormones coming from the brain to the ovary. And so I have many women who are doing IVF or alternatively an embryo transfer or indeed just ovulation induction who wish to continue breastfeeding. I suppose the correlate to that is that sometimes because of the higher estrogen levels that are being produced during the fertility process, the breast milk may decrease in amount or alternatively it may change in its consistent texture and taste and therefore um, the baby or the child may wean off the breast. So you have to be comfortable that that process may occur. Why after PGS pregnancy can it fail? So this is an embryo that's been tested. As I said, a whole range of factors. We've talked about the uterus. We've talked about hormonal issues, autoimmune conditions, uh, structural abnormalities of the uterus. So just because we've accounted for the genetics of the embryo doesn't necessarily mean, unfortunately, that there isn't another issue. I certainly encourage you to be uh, able to look at, um, you know, look into that. I also... I'm doing more and more, and most of you will be familiar with uh, with what I talk about on Instagram, but I also talk about endometrial receptivity assay testing in order to time 
a personalised embryo transfer and I offer that to my patients. Um, there are a multitude of reasons as to why IVF is not successful. I suppose that is a broader discussion that I'd like to do at a later point in time, um, but it's something that I think is particularly important. There are a few questions that people have asked, and I might finish off with these last two questions. So if you do have any further ones, please put them in because uh, time is now running short. But uh, once you have got your first period after DNC, should you get your blood test checked to make sure the HCG is zero? zero or can you start again straight away? I tend to want to follow the, the pregnancy hormone down to zero. Um, sometimes there can be an amount of lingering pregnancy hormone, which may mean you're not, you don't get your period. So it's nice to know that everything's down to zero and that it's not so much getting a period, actually, it's more that you'll ovulate. Unless that pregnancy hormone level is down to zero, you won't ovulate and you won't be able to conceive. Um, I, I, if, if any of you unfortunately have had a DNC or will, or or know of someone who's who's having a DNC, just make sure the doctor does an ultrasound scan at the time of the, the surgery. I always do an ultrasound scan after I've completed the surgery because I want to make sure that the uterus is, is as empty as it possibly can be. Of course, there'll always be a bit of clot and there's always the potential, unfortunately, of us leaving a small amount of tissue within the uterus, even after a DNC. And that's partly because it is a blind procedure. We, we're not doing it with a camera, we're doing it with a blind procedure. It's like going into a room, unfortunately, and vacuuming and it's totally dark and we may leave a certain amount. It's actually preferential to leave a little bit than over curette, over put in the vacuum to, to try to remove the the, the products within the uterus, because sometimes that can cause adhesions within the uterus, which in itself can lead to concerns with fertility. So don't be upset if your doctor says to you, look, unfortunately, there's a little bit of tissue left there and we do need to go back. Angie's written, what is the kind of help offered for women with premature ovarian failure? I've got several patients at the moment who have got premature ovarian failure. Um, two of which have become pregnant in most recent times and two of which at the moment we're still um, hoping uh, will become pregnant. One woman unfortunately became pregnant but had a, a miscarriage early on in pregnancy. There are things that we can do. One of those things can be in doing platelet-rich plasma where we inject um, your own platelets so we get a sample of blood cells from the or your blood from from uh, a blood sample, we wash that down and just get the serum with platelets, and we inject that directly into the ovaries at the time of during a laparoscopy. And then I tend to do something called estrogen priming. I want you to imagine that the ovaries are like, or the ovarian function is a bit like a fireplace. A woman who's got a good ovarian function, doesn't have premature ovarian failure or premature menopause, will have a rip-roaring fire. And so if you have FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, which you use for injections, imagine that's like a log. If you put that log on the fireplace, that fire will grow beautifully. But unfortunately for women who have premature ovarian failure, their ovaries are just like a small little ember, a little flicker of light. And if you go get a massive log, a big amount of FSH, and you dump that on that little flickering ember, Unfortunately, that will snuff out the oxygen and the, and the fire will go out. But sometimes what we need to do is we need to withdraw that FSH, withdraw that high level of stimulation that the brain is doing on the ovaries to relieve, to relieve the ovary, to allow it to function. And we do that through a process of estrogen priming, where we give you a bit of estrogen to try to suppress the FSH levels and allow the follicle to slowly develop. And during a woman's life, even if you've unfortunately had premature ovarian failure, the chance of a pregnancy is about 5% over the course of your lifetime. So it does involve a lot of ultrasound scans, a lot of blood tests to try to see what's happening in those ovaries. And the last question from Bree is, what are the chances of retained products after a natural miscarriage or does your body normally clean everything out? Unfortunately, even following a natural miscarriage, there is a possibility that a small amount of tissue can be left. And around 30% of women may require a suction DNC after they've had a natural miscarriage. So to those women of mine who do choose to have a natural miscarriage, which I advocate for, I'll always encourage them to come back after they've stopped bleeding just to make sure the lining of the womb is completely thin. 
I thank you all for your time today. And I know that um, this topic for many of you who've had a miscarriage can be quite distressing. And the prospect of entering into another pregnancy with the potential of a future pregnancy loss can be quite daunting. As I said before, I hope that you have all the supports in place to be able to support you during not only this difficult time if you've had a pregnancy loss, but of course, uh, through any future pregnancy that you might have. And I wish you the best of luck and I can assure all of you that with a good team in place, um, we will do the best that we possibly can and that there will be brighter days ahead for all of you. Have a good night.